assuming everyone can I'm assuming everyone now can see this. Yes. Thumbs up. Great. Thank you. So again, welcome. This is sort of the beginning of a conversation emerging from a project that Reverend Dr. Alan Jorgensen and I have been working on for the last two years. It's a study exploring the spiritual care needs of parents raising children with disabilities. And before we get started, I have a few thank yous. First, I need to acknowledge that this emerges from funding we received from the Louisville Institute, and we're very grateful for their support. Um, it's been a wonderful two-year experience working with both Alan and all of the parents in the study. I also have other thank yous. Um, we have, I have to thank Alan, I have to thank our, our, our A's, Josephine, Dana, Kate, and Laura. I need to thank the parents who are involved in the study. I need to thank Reverend Dr. Aaron Rafferty, but that will happen later today. Um, I also want to thank the student team who has joined us for their afternoon or this afternoon, which uh, is huge knowing how busy this time of year is. They're giving up some time to be here to help with breakout rooms, to manage chat discussions, to manage the tech because I'm afraid of it. Um, so huge thanks to Jackson, Susan, Newer, Caitlin, Jilly, Cassidy, Emily, and Priel, who are here today to, to lend a hand. So how did we get here? My story began about 23 years ago, and it ultimately led to this project or to proposing this project to Alan, who joined me, and then uh, we spent two years listening to parents. Um, back in 1999, I gave birth to my second of three children. Matthew was born with significant physical and intellectual disabilities and, and lived with lots of medical complications. At the time of his birth, my husband and I were very active in church. We attended regularly. My husband was on the finance committee. I taught Sunday school. We were very active and considered church an important part of our community. But as I sort of entered into this journey of parenting a complex care child, my relationship with church became more complicated. And by the time Matthew was in grade school, our family had more or less withdrawn altogether from church attendance and participation. And the reasons for that are complicated and align with the research, which I'm gonna share a little bit about this afternoon. So briefly, um, the research tells us that parenting a child with disabilities is a paradoxical experience. Parents raising children with disabilities adore their children. They love their children. Their children are, is in any case of parenting, a source of unmitigated and unending joy. Our children are a gift. However, our lives can also be chaotic and complicated and at times feel burdensome. The research is pretty clear that it's not that the children are burdens. Many of us don't see our children as burdens, but at times the care can be burdensome and overwhelming. Parents raising children with disabilities can experience a broad range of stressors and these include physical challenges, emotional difficulties, financial stressors, often because a parent needs to leave employment to manage care or to provide uh, support to their child. Um, often parents become socially isolated. Their lives can become quite limited. Their opportunity to be involved with their friends, to enjoy hobbies, to hold a job, as I mentioned, all of this can become very complicated, um, even difficult or impossible. And as a result, their lives become challenging and paradoxical. As Alan and I were considering this project, we noted that churches have incredible gifts to offer. They have all sorts of spiritual support to provide. They can be a source of prayer. They can be an important source of community and friendship for socially isolated families and parents. They can also be an incredible support for all sorts of practical, uh, practical needs. So meals, laundry, play dates, shoveling a driveway, walking a dog, things that an overwhelmed parent may struggle to get done sometimes. And we know that churches do a wonderful job of providing this kind of support during acute moments. So when someone's in a hospital, 
The challenge might be when these moments continue for longer periods of time. But families identified that they would benefit from this enormously, and these are potential gifts and resources that faith communities might have to share. Unfortunately, the research is also pretty clear that that often doesn't happen. Families raising children with disabilities leave church often, in particular families raising children with intellectual disabilities. And there can be lots of reasons for that. It can be problematic theology, it can be difficulty getting into the building, physical access can still be quite compromised, or perhaps the sanctuary is accessible, but places a family or a child might need to get to aren't. So Sunday school rooms, youth group activities, social activities, and so on. The other worrying thing is that parents identified that they sometimes felt they could be on the receiving end of judgmental attitudes. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit in the next few minutes. And the church community I belong to, we talk about a wide circle. We sing about drawing a circle wide. But research actually suggests that we still have work to do in terms of widening our circle and creating it so people can be part of it. Research demonstrates that often faith communities and churches are in the early stages of improving access, and often that includes physical accessibility and perhaps not other forms of accessibility. Many, and, and despite that, many places are often still physically inaccessible. Many parents talk about feeling not accepted within a community, and that even if they're there, they're sometimes not sure they fit in. The research is pretty clear that educational, um, sorry, religious education and rituals frequently can feel inaccessible, again, particularly for children with intellectual disabilities. So participating in rites of passage or religious rituals like uh, confirmation may not be accessible to all children. And that parents will advocate for accommodations, but often they feel they are unmet. So what we've learned from the research, at least, is that there are numerous barriers in faith communities, and these take all sorts of forms. There are physical, social, attitudinal, and spiritual and theological. So this led Alan and I to ask this research question. How can Canadian church communities support the faith journeys and spiritual care needs of parents raising children with disabilities? And while we were particularly interested in Canadian church communities, I like to think that this is a conversation that might also move beyond Canada. So the method we used was interviews. We spent time listening to the stories of 20 parents, and we were very, very intentional about making sure that there were parents who were actively in involved in their faith community, some who had outright left their community, and using the language of Facebook, some who were in a complicated relationship with their church. And what was really interesting is that even parents who attended regularly and faithfully often described a complicated, even conflicted relationship with church. These interviews were transcribed verbatim, so we uh, word for word had them typed, and that provides textual information we can study. We also sanitize them, which means we remove all sorts of identifying information, names, locations, those sorts of things. So anything you hear today, and I'll be sharing some quotes, quotes in a little bit, have been sanitized. Names have been changed. We actually used uh, names from the Bible. Um, and anything that might have identified a family is also changed. So uh, the name of a hospital or the name of a city. And these were analyzed for emerging themes, some of which we're going to share today. Idea, mostly I've tried to focus this little bit on what might be helpful for church communities. We learned from the parents that when church works, parents feel welcomed and supported and heard and included and safe. Safe was huge. We heard repeatedly from families that church felt unsafe. And when it was working, they knew that their child was safe. And safety actually ultimately included all of the previous, included, heard, supported, and welcomed. Yet, what we learned from the majority of parents in the study was that they generally felt that church didn't do those things. Church often felt exclusive. They often felt that they were on the receiving end of judgmental attitudes. 
they felt isolated within their faith communities and often felt depleted. So rather than going to a church uh, service or a worship service and feeling renewed and supported and refreshed, they would feel uh, they would leave feeling depleted. So this, of course, raises many concerns. One huge theme that was particularly interesting was the, the theme of church as a neurosensory nightmare. Many of the parents in the study, or several at least, were, in, were raising children on the autism spectrum disorder or children who are neurodiverse. And the sensory experience of church they shared was often overwhelming for their child, leaving, leading to behavioral complications. Um, and these were often inappropriately labeled as a temper tantrum and the child was labeled as difficult rather than the behavior understood as a natural and logical response to a, a sensory experience that was overwhelming for the child. And this was their way of communicating that they weren't able to cope with the sensory information. So an example of a quote for that was Elizabeth. Elizabeth said, we couldn't be in church. There were just too many sensory problems. The building was old. It had creaky mothball issues. It had that little bit of a sensory, the lights. I tried to explain to them that the lights were very noisy for the children. And as a result, this would lead to behavioral outbursts on their children to the point that many families simply stopped attending. To share some other quotes from parents about some of the, the experiences they had in church that were concerning and problematic included Joanna. Joanna said, I don't want to say, say I walked away from church because that's not the right word. I got pushed out. Rachel said, there were times when I asked, could you just come and spend some time with him, her child, her son? And I asked the minister and he was like, no, no, I'm not comfortable with that. So again, continuing feelings of isolation, even when requesting support and companionship. Elizabeth said, I called them on it. My child's diagnosis isn't a sin. This one to me was particularly troubling because it suggests that despite our, com our conversations and the general belief that we no longer link disability as a punishment to sin, this attitude seems to persist, at least in implicit ways in some faith communities. And I will share that Elizabeth wasn't the only parent to talk about this. Sarah said, it's a circle of people looking inward. You know, people still looking inward instead of looking outward. They're quite happy with smiles on their faces and they have no comprehension of the exclusion. So we asked parents, what would you like church to be? What would you want from church? And they were very clear. They said, really, we'd like practical support. Our lives are overwhelming. Those meals you deliver when people are in hospital, we'd appreciate them semi-regularly. Perhaps people would invite our children for play dates or take a dog for a walk if I'm overwhelmed or come and fold my laundry and stay and have coffee. They asked for people to listen to them and to be unafraid of the story they would tell, whether that's a complicated story of grief or pain or joy, simply be with them in the story to listen to it. Many parents lamented the fact that church leadership and church communities didn't understand disability, didn't know a lot about disability. They asked communities, including church leadership, to make an effort to learn about disability, not only their child's disability, but disability more broadly and ways to include people with disabilities in their community. And that included not just physical disabilities, not just people who required mobility aids or wheelchairs, but mental health challenges and invisible disabilities or vis uh, disabilities that might impact a child's behavior to understand disability more broadly. Above all, they wanted to feel included, accommodated, and welcomed. So much so that for the first handful of interviews, I was worried that rather than hearing stories of spiritual care and their desire for spiritual care, I kept hearing stories about church access and church inclusion and church accommodation. And I was getting a little concerned that I was asking the wrong questions. And then it dawned on me that for these parents, knowing their children were welcome and included and accommodated in their faith communities, that they were safe, 
was in fact a form of spiritual care, and perhaps the most important form of spiritual care for these parents. But above all, what these parents wanted was friends. They wanted people to have coffee with them, to call them, to listen to them, to be with them, to spend time with them, and to do it in such a way that they just were with them, listening to their story, whatever it was, whatever they were experiencing the moment, and didn't feel a need to step in and try to fix things or offer advice or say they understood, just to be with them, to be their friend. This was by far the biggest ask of the group, repeatedly. So I often feel like I need to finish these presentations with a checklist of things churches could do or should do to improve access or to improve welcome for people with disabilities. And I wish it were that easy. I wish I could say, well, if you widen your doorways and make your bathroom accessible and put large print bulletins out, that will be accessible. Churches will be accessible. And I would encourage you to do that if you haven't do that, done that. But it's more complicated than that. What families really wanted were a list of things that faith communities would do so that they could become part of the community if they weren't already. They wanted people who are willing to ask them what they needed to be part of the community if they weren't there. And a willingness to listen to what they would have to say. And then to go and learn from those conversations and to act on them, a willingness to change. They were frustrated by conversations of, well, this is the way it's always been, or this is the way we do things here. In that case, there's an emphasis that they need to fit in. They need to become what the community is, normalize themselves to that community, rather than the community perhaps listening and saying, these are ways that we can include people, we can welcome people who aren't in the door. And ultimately, a willingness to accommodate, to welcome people. Really, what they wanted more than anything was a sense of at-homeness, a feeling of that they belonged, that this was their home. They wanted to feel welcomed, and they wanted to feel that they belonged, so much so that if they weren't there, they were missed, and their child was missed. They wanted more than anything else to know church was safe. They wanted to know their children were safe. And this meant that their children could be involved and could participate. They could let their children go to activities without worry or anxiety. They wanted to know their children wouldn't be judged if they had a moment of difficulty or they became upset or withdrawn. But more than anything, they wanted non-anxious friendship. They wanted families or uh, community members who would be with them, listen to them, welcome them, not try to fix them and not try to fix their story, to understood, understand that we all come with complicated stories and simply be their friend. So I'm gonna stop now um, and I'm gonna actually hand it over to Alan and then I'm looking forward to a conversation before a break and hearing from Aaron. Thank you so much. Thanks, Laura. I'm just going to load up a little PowerPoint here. People seeing that? All right. So um, I'm just going to do a little bit of theological reflection on um, some of the um, con uh, pieces that Laura has uh, brought forward. Um, I'm entitling my uh, short presentation, The Edgy and Disabled Church. I first begin by locating myself. I was born to Lacadia Zummer. Um, an immigrant and Ken Jorgensen, the son of immigrants on Treaty 6 territory in Alberta. I now live, as I mentioned earlier, on the Haldeman Tract, uh, the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. I live in gratitude to the first people of the land and to the land itself. I am a seemingly able-bodied, straight, cisgendered white male uh, living with extraordinary privilege who was surprised when Joanna, one of our informants, all whose identities have been changed, started our interview by telling me. So now I'm going to interview you. For you getting involved, what was the catalyst for you? I told uh, Joanna that Laura invited me into the project, which has expanded my theological world and continues to do so. She then finished by saying, you have to have some interest in it, and not a lot of people have interest in people raising children with disabilities. That is, of course, extraordinarily sad, but it was not altogether surprising to me that this has not really interested the church. 
The study has certainly enlightened me in many ways, but I want to underline two. Uh, the first is that caring for these parents implies um, and, and so includes supporting children with disabilities. I, I think that was pretty clear. Secondly, the idea of a supporting church has invited me to realize that a church that lives authentically is an edgy and disabled community. Let me say that again. A church that lives authentically is an edgy and disabled community. An important start point for me, a uh, starting point for me in thinking through this came from Joanna, who in discussing her experience of the church noted, I don't get filled by going to church. If anything, I'm depleted. I'm not necessarily needing the institution of the church. I have less and less tolerance for the institution, for the structure, unless they're going to change it for my kids. Other parents described how the church lost out because of its rejection of their children, children who embodied God, God's presence to the community. Perhaps Esther best summed it up when she said, my children are not defined by what they're going or not going to do in the future. They're defined by being an actual human being that's created by God. So we begin then with creation. Creation, the church, and words of God. In his Genesis lectures, Martin Luther wrote that humans, the sun, the moon, the stars, are all words of God. We are proclamations of God. We might even imagine ourselves together to be a sermon. I think that my listening to the parents of children with disabilities has underscored that the gathered church is itself a word of God, and that the absence of certain members of that community is equivalent to an incomplete sermon. And so the church needs to embrace its members with disabilities such that it identifies itself as disabled, as a disabled church. There's a need then for the church to do what many uh, people with disabilities have done in fully embracing their identity and coming out crip, as Miriam Spees puts it. A church that identifies as disabled is enabled in manifestly diverse ways. Persons with disabilities are also a word of God, God talk, God communication. And so we need to ask, what are we missing when they are missing? What does it mean to be an edgy and disabled church? Many of our informants describe themselves as on the edge of the church. Consider Sarah. I would say I'm probably on the edge of the church. I kind of dance. I always have an in and out relationship with the church. But I think that for me, there's something in the Gospels that deeply resonates with who I am as a person. I like the idea of being on the edge. I like the idea of an edgy church, an edgy and disabled church. An edgy and disabled church attends to those at the far ends, at the edges, at the margins. It attends to those who too often are ignored, but who have much to offer the church, including and especially those living with disabilities and their caregivers. In what follows, I explore the edgy and disabled church as one, being real, two, as celebrating, three, as being okay, and four, as not always believing. These four might be the four marks of the church the edgy and disabled church. Number one, being real. The Cree theologian Ray Aldred once told me a critical ministry question is, what's really going on here? What's really going on? Elizabeth answered that question. She said, we often have this princess theology that thinks we're always the one in the right and persecuted and the one that needs to defend ourselves. And yet, we're often the oppressors, and we're the ones that Jesus spoke strongly to. She also noted that a huge part of the Imago Dei, or the image of God, is missed when we exclude people with disabilities and their caregivers. And so she invites us to be expansive in being real. Chloe asks us to ponder the following. What is God thinking? And is God doing something? Or is God not doing something? Should I be looking God for looking for God to be doing something? Those kind of questions, I think, are what makes faith uh, real every day and not just a Sunday situation. So far, Chloe. A church that keeps it real asks, what is God up to? 
and learns to look in nooks and crannies for her divine fingerprints. It learns to feel for womb-like room in the care of mothers on the edge. Celebrating. Many parents spoke of how people were quick to lament rather than celebrate their children. Judith noted, yes, Peter will be awkward, but don't we get to celebrate his successes? He's done so well and made, made so many strides and so much improvement. Informant after informant spoke of this. Sarah commented on how people responded to Junia with pity and consolation when what she really wanted to hear was, look at her, isn't she great? An edgy church that invites us to query normal, to celebrate all, and to hold each child as a word of God is a church that is an edgy and disabled church. And it's a church that's okay with being okay. As we celebrate people with disability and their care caregivers, we accord them dignity and support, their ability to be at peace with themselves. Mary commented concerning Enoch. I mean, ideally, I'd love him for him to just see, you know, what a beautiful spirit he is and how he can be very good hearted at times. This mother knows her son's spirit because she can see beyond the cult of normalcy. Yochabed responded to the prompt, if there was anything you could say to the church, what would it be? She said, grace, grace for those who are different, grace for those who struggle to make it into the pew on time. Grace for a kid who, for some reason, shows up wearing a t-shirt and shorts because he doesn't like the scratchy feel of dress pants and a dress shirt. And finally, the not always believing church. The religious expression of our informants and their children was as, were as varied as they and their situation. But unlike the parents we spoke with, some of the children identified as atheists. Judith said that Peter's at the stage now where he says, I don't think God is real, and I don't believe this. But still, still, Peter joined them in church, which was welcoming and supportive, and made significant connections there. But some children with disabilities were hostile to the church. And so Yochabed said, I think we're considered, I think I've considered maybe approaching an atheist organization to try to support him and to develop a more mature narrative. He really does need community support to help him to make up his mind on these things. This disabled church at the margins then also includes those who do not believe and those who seek to support people in their unbelief. Atheists, atheism then is internal to the church and actually a reasonable response to the religious beliefs and activities of some Christians. The church has given birth to atheism such that it is in many ways a child of Christianity. And just as every child is to be celebrated, including the children who live with disabilities, this phenomenon of two of, of disbelief also can be celebrated. And even might be, for some of us, paradoxically, a word of God. In conclusion, I want to note that I began with the account of Joanna turning the microphone back on me, which makes it clear for me that this gift uh, that this uh, that it has been a gift to be invited by Laura into this project. Laura was, as I noted, jo Joanna, a student of mine at one point. She's now a colleague and also my doctor, my teacher, who has generously welcomed me into researching an edgy and disabled church from a unique, complex, and paradoxical place. I am grateful indeed to Laura for this invitation, grateful for the informants and their families, grateful for the contribution of the research assistants, Dana, Laura, Josephine, and Kate, grateful today for the students here helping us out and to, for the support of the Louisville Institute. And I'm especially grateful to all of you who are with us today for this important conversation.